Hello there and welcome to this week's portrait painting demonstration. My name is Yupari and in this week's portrait painting video we're going to take the one that we started last week. Uh, remember we created an underpainting with just titanium white and raw umber in a kind of old master inspired style. And so now we're going to take that painting and we're going to uh, basically go over it with color. So we're going to build onto the underpainting using successive layers of color. All right, welcome back everyone. This is going to be the second pass on this painting. So remember this underpainting was completed um, just by doing a uh, preliminary drawing right on top of the canvas uh, with charcoal and then going over those lines with pastel pencil and then going over it with just titanium white and raw umber. I'm going to leave a link in the description below to um, the video where this painting was started. Uh, so if you haven't seen that one then um, I'll just leave the link in the description so you can uh, go and watch that. So the first thing I'll do with the underpainting is um, I'll take a little bit of medium. So my medium is actually in this uh, kind of fish cup. So my medium is a gel-like medium. It's called Neo McGilp. And um, if you want to know exactly what materials I'm using, you can go ahead and scroll down to the description box below. And I'll have all of that information typed up for you. So now, uh, what I'm doing is called oiling out, which means I'm just applying oil to a dry layer of oil paint. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I can bring back, see how you can see clearly the dark is coming back. So I'm bringing back the tone uh, or the tones that were applied onto this painting in the previous layer. And uh, this also helps with the layering process. Um, that is, we're all familiar, or we have possibly heard the term fat over lean principle in the past. So the fat over lean principle is just um, basically kind of like a general rule in layering oil paintings. That is when you're layering over top of dry paintings such as this one. So the principle states that you want to use more and more medium as you go. So the more medium you use, the more lean the paint becomes. So now I don't know if this is completely true, but I speculate that applying the medium when you're oiling out like this kind of automatically creates that kind of fat over lean effect for you because now the layer that we're applying or that we are going to be applying is going to automatically have more oil than the previous layer. Even if I don't use this medium at all anymore, I'm going to still have this layer. And another thing about the medium, so Neo McGilp is a fast drying medium. Uh, so that will help the painting dry. So if I'm going to be working on this multiple times throughout the week, then the fast dryer will help uh, speed up the drying times. Now, if you want to work even longer in just one day, uh, then you can certainly use something like a slow dryer. So that should be about good uh, with covering the surface with the Neoma Gilp. Covered most of it, I think. All right, so the palette that I'll be using today consists of flake white, titanium white, burnt umber, alizarin crimson permanent, cadmium red medium, yellow ochre, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. So I'm going to stick to a primi primarily limited tone color mixtures, that is limited color uh, flesh tone mixtures, excuse me, yes, limited palette flesh tone mixtures. And that is because I'm going to try and keep this painting kind of uh, old master style. Now I say the word style uh, because I don't want to say that I'm using an old master technique and that would be misguiding you uh, because I, I don't know how the old masters worked. I can only speculate how they worked based on uh, what other teachers have told me and um, what art conservationists have figured out. 
So we can only know so much. So I'm going to say that this is going to be in the style of the old masters. And I'm not going to say that I'm going to use an old master technique. In any case, so my first flesh tone combination was cadmium red, yellow ochre, titanium white, a little bit of flake white. So let me explain why I have two whites. So flake white um, allows me to use more of it without raising the value too much. So it allows me to create kind of a heavier body of paint in the middle tonality. So I'm switching to now burnt umber. Now if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm looking at the image and I'm just kind of trying to replicate some of the flesh tones that I'm seeing. Uh, first, and I'm going to create a little value scale of flesh tones so that I can kind of establish the tonality on my palette first. In any case, flake white allows me to use more of it here in the middle tones. Uh, now, if I were to switch to like a titanium white, look at that, it's going to raise up the value even though I'm only using a tiny bit of it. So rather than using a tiny bit of titanium, I'm using the same amount of flake in the middle tones as I would uh, titanium in the lighter tones. Just helps me create more body in the painting. All right, so now I'm gonna use a combination of sap green and alizarin permanent. So sap green, alizarin permanent are two colors basically made for each other. Now, with the Middle tones, such as this one here, I'm kind of looking at, say, this area. So these regions of the painting, that's where these values would probably fit. Now, um, I'm going to emphasize the understanding of the principles involved in creating form. And I'm going to emphasize that the principles now this is in my opinion, I'm going to emphasize that the principles such as shape, value, color, I think are much more important than the literal copying of the photograph. Now I know that there are some drawing discrepancies with this. I know that this shape might have to move in a little more. I know that the mouse might be a little bit too big. I know that the angle of the eyes isn't exactly right. With the photo reference, yes, I'm aware of that. But I'm going to emphasize the fact that I'm not copying the image that I'm looking at. Rather, I'm taking the visual information presented in front of me and interpreting it in a way that uh, is aesthetically compelling, meaning that it's pleasant for me to observe. Now, a lot of artists have said painting is the art of seeing, and um, I kind of adhere to that, but at the same time, I think it's a lot about the storytelling. And the story I'm trying to tell is not, this is the perfect photographic rendition of the model. It's, these are shapes, and these shapes are in such a way that they are reminiscent of the beauty in nature. All right, so now we have a very simple uh, flesh tone, I would say warm flesh tone, color combination going on here. Now I know that there are some warmer tones right around here and I'm suspecting that the pinker flesh tones I will be able to mix in here as I go but this is a good little starting point to uh, get me at least ready for the flesh tone applications. So now switching to a clean brush I'm going to start to observe some of the plane changes. So I'm gonna start with this one right here. Now in the last video, I said that I would make the values in the light a little bit whiter, or sorry, a little bit brighter than need be so that I could come back and create a stained glass type effect. Do you remember I said that? So now we're gonna do that. So what we're gonna do is take very thin applications of paint. Uh, notice I'm kind of just tapping onto the surface. Now with very thin applications of paint, I'm going to allow the underpainting to show through in some areas such as this one. And that will hopefully create more of a kind of a, a glow to the painting. 
Now we're going to introduce our first plane change. So remember, plane changes basically just indicate um, where the form is existing in relation to the light. So basically, this is our first plane change in color. One plane here, another plane here. Can't miss it. All it is is just a change in value. Now, this value change is occurring because this area right here, this lighter area, is much more perpendicular to the light source than this area. So the areas in the light that are more perpendicular to the light source uh, in general are going to receive more light, such as this area here, this area here, and so on. So now I'm going to just uh, observe the plane changes one step at a time. All right, so as we work our way around here, it's going to get darker. Okay, so now that I'm applying these plane changes, another thing I should talk about are uh, basically local colors versus, well, non-local colors. So a local color would be kind of the color that something is. So the color of her flesh tone is a local color. Now her flesh tone, the local color of her flesh tone, is going to be different, or it's going to appear different in different light lighting scenarios. So say that I was using a uh, really, really bright halogen light to illuminate the model. Her flesh tones would look a little more orangey, orangey, almost maybe violet, kind of. Now the lighting used for this is very similar to daylight. Now, daylight would mean that the value changes are much more subtle, and they're a little bit cooler, of course, depending on the time of day. Now, if this was early morning light, uh, then you'd be kind of closer to that halogen type of lighting, but in this instance, uh, the flesh tone changes are very, very slight. Meaning that these color changes aren't going to be too extreme. Now, um, it appears to me that this region here uh, this plane change as we go across the side of the forehead is a little bit greenish or should I say gray-ish. So I'm going to take only a tiny bit of ivory black. And I'm going to let the underpainting describe the rest of that color change. And at the same time, I'm thinking of these edges. I'm thinking of the edge between the, basically the forehead and the hair, so the hairline. Now this edge, I want to be extremely soft. I want this to be one of the softest edges. If I make this edge too sharp, it's going to kind of stick out in a way that I don't want it to stick out. So now I'm going to move on from this area to this area. Now. I'm just kind of cleaning my brush by uh, kind of just applying a little piece of paper towel to it. Now I'm aware that I have a tendency of making colors a bit too muddy, I've been told. So I'm going to try to kind of combat that by uh, varying the hues a little bit. So here we're a little more on the pinkish side. And here we're going to be a little bit, let's apply some ultramarine blue, but only a tiny bit. If you look at a lot of old master paintings, uh, there's really not a lot of blue, not a lot of violet in the paintings. Can't really tell you why that is. Maybe it's because that color wasn't invented yet. 
depending on the time frame of the painting. But and by color and being invented, I mean the pigment. Uh, maybe it wasn't available yet. Who knows? All right, so this plane here is going to be a little bit darker than this plane. But all around, I want it to be lighter than I had it in the underpainting. So let's make this lighter. Now this is how we build on top of the underpainting. Now, you can also make drawing corrections with your underpainting as well. So, one drawing correction I'm going to create is the shape of the globella, that is this plane right here. Uh, so I'm going to actually make it a little bit larger. Um, with the color, I'm actually just pushing that shape out a little bit. See that? Kind of pushing that out. And yes, I know I'm going to have to correct the shape for the mouth. And remember, I'm not trying to copy uh, the image that I'm being presented with. It's a little bit lighter here. Now this plane here is closer to perpendicular to the light source. Closer than, say, that plane. So let's make it lighter. And um, I'm not applying any more medium. The medium that I applied in the beginning of this painting when we oiled this out uh, is actually helping the paint application quite a bit. And uh, it's helping by just kind of automatically kind of thinning it out as we apply it onto the uh, dry underpainting. So let's go a little bit darker around here, the side of the eye socket, even darker. Let's go with this color here. Let's use a little bit of ultramarine blue, but remember, not too much. In fact, let's just use the ivory black, because ivory black is nothing more than a very neutral blue, in my opinion, depending on the brand. And uh, the brand I'm using for that color is, I believe, Winsor & Newton. And again, the materials I'm using, as you know, are typed in the description box for you. I'm thinking of the general form, the overall form of this shape, as opposed to the literal depiction of the shapes. So let's use a little more warm colors from the mid-range. Just apply it here. Now I know there's a bit of a uh, little bit of makeup here, and um, that's a detail I'm gonna get to later. I'm much more focused on the structure of the shapes first. A little more light right here, just beneath the tear duct. Remember the tear duct right there. It's the area where the tears come down when you're feeling a bit emotional. So let's get a little more from the mid range, right over here. I'll tell you what, there's quite a bit of color variance there, so that I'm not going to ignore. I'm gonna use the ivory black and the titanium white, rather, and then mix this color into these colors. To try and get the hue change here. Once I have that, I'm going to go to the darker region of the palette and I'm going to emphasize this shape here. So that is the concavity of the eye socket. And it's fairly dark, so I got to make sure um, that I portray it accurately. And in fact, I'm going to add even more ivory black to this kind of grayish mixture. Just like that. And then I'm going to go back to the darker region of the palette. And 
And I'm going to add some of that color here. Now this area is kind of tricky. It's both warm and it's cool. Now how do you make something warm and cool at the same time? Well, if you're painting opaque, then you gotta pick one. Um, meaning just one flat color, but we're not painting opaque, meaning we're letting some layers show through. So the layer beneath is cooler, right? So we're gonna go over top of that uh, in kind of a scumbling fashion. So this is what I mean by scumbling, just kind of lightly just pushing the paint onto it. And I'm going to apply kind of some broken color here, uh, meaning that I'm going to let some of the cool notes or the cool colors underneath show through. And yes, I know that the eye, uh, the angle between the eyes needs to be more like this. I'm aware of that. Um, but it's not really bothering me. If I want to change that later, I certainly can. So let's go lighter. Add some lighter chain. Oh, sorry, a lighter plane change here. And I'm going to kind of ignore that um, reddish color right here. I'm going to ignore that for now and come back to it thinking of the large structure right now. So let's get a lighter tone for this area here. Darker tone here. And I'm using a warmer color uh, than need me because I want some of the gray from the underpainting to show through. And another word for this type of underpainting is grisaille. All right. Now, uh, speaking of building on top of the grisaille or underpainting, this transition, so right here, so this light plane is going to be very important in defining the edge between the corner of the nose and the side of the face. Now, rather than literally going in here and drawing an outline to uh, tell the viewer that this is a change between the side of the nose and the cheeks, I'm going to make this edge through value transition. So making this edge here, sorry, this shape here lighter, and this shape here darker. And through that uh, value uh, comparison or through that value contrast, I should be able to get a very nice and soft edge. Let's get some more of this color here. Let's kind of push that in there. Nice and healthy, warm color. When in doubt, with flesh tone, go warmer. Definitely don't go cooler if you're in doubt of the flesh tone. So a little bit lighter here, but not quite as light as this region. So I'll tell you what, so when we look at one plane, uh, let's move across the other side and look how that plane exists on the other side. So here it is. So this plane, imagine this going right here. So think about it structurally. This plane relating to this plane. Now then, of course, uh, we're definitely going to have to use a little more uh, warmth. So a tiny bit of the cadmium red medium into this. Very tiny. Gonna make this edge here quite soft and even a little bit of alizarin permanent. So a little bit of alizarin permanent in here. Very tiny. Now there's gonna be another plane change. 
right about here is going to be a plane change. So plane change between here and here is described by change in value. So this value is going to be lighter. Nice and simple. Now let's go down to the middle region of the palette. And as we work our way from this plane, it's going to get darker. Very simple. Now then, we're going to need some color for the nose, right? So let's go ahead and add a little bit of alizarin permanent. Mix into the darker region of the palette. And just kind of very, in a thin fashion, just painting right onto this. Letting quite a bit of the underpainting show through. Switching back to the other brush. Let's take some light right about here. Add a little bit more cadmium red medium to the middle light region. And there's just a little more pink showing through there. Just a little more pink. Now let's take some of this gray a tiny bit of it and mix into here. And now we have the plane for the bulb of the nose. In the underpainting, it was a little too round. So now we're going to go in and add some more definitive plane changes to make it look even more solid. Going down here. So a very definitive plane change between here and here is what we need. Let's go ahead and reinforce that shape. Add a little bit of light right about there. And I have too much of that side of the uh, nose showing. So let's get a little bit more light. Just kind of with the value, just push this in. Pushing that shape in there. And now the nose is starting to look a little more solid. So let's go around the warmer region of the middle tone. Just spread the color down here. When in doubt, go a little warmer. lighter region of the flesh tones. So this plane looks a little cooler in temperature, the relative hue of this region. So this light shape right here is the filtrum of the mouth. Um, so what I'm going to do is let some of the underpainting show there. So I painted a little more uh, thin and then let the underpainting itself uh, kind of describe some of the hue change. A little bit closer to the middle tone side. And here we have another plane change. Let's take some of this lighter region and paint a little more opaque now for this side of this shape, just so we have a little more warmth. Now in the middle region, let's get some light here. Just kind of connect these two planes to one another.
Now, as we approach these planes, they're going to get much darker. I'm not too worried about the hue changes at this point. That can always be adjusted, and I probably will adjust them. I'm much more focused on the value at this point. Lighter here. Now the lips, let's use a little bit of alizarin permanent into the middle region, the darker middle region of the flesh tones. And just kind of lightly just apply that. Kind of like a flat color, still letting the underpainting show through. See that? Letting some of the underpainting still show through. Now then, back to the lighter region of the palette. This area here is closer to being perpendicular to the light source. Notice how we have a little W shape on the bottom there. This little W shape. That's the bottom of the orbicularis oris, the structure that encompasses the mouth. Also one of the muscles of the face. Then let's just lightly add some of this over top. Very nice and simple. Now the concern is for the plane changes. And the best way to describe the plane changes is through value. We're focusing much more on the value. But there should be some consideration for uh, the shape. So now that we're here, let's go ahead and fix this shape. So I just used a combination of burnt umber and ultramarine blue. Kind of push that shape up a little bit. That shape was starting to bother me. And back to the middle region of the palette. Let's go ahead and add this plane change here. Side plane of the chin. Back to the lighter plane. It's kind of like the middle. It's kind of like the top plane of the chin. And then like a really light plane over here. Now going back to the middle region of the palette, just go ahead and describe this plane change a little better. Plane change right here. Middle region of the palette being very thin, applying the application very thin. Now at this point, I'm just going to push the paint into here. And again, I know there's some color variation there that I need to describe. The first thing I want to do is just lay down a ground here. Now with a larger brush, I'm going to create the same uh, type of flesh tone colors to cover the rest of the uh, areas containing flesh tone. And again, the goal is to emphasize the structure. So I'm going to focus on the value. And um, so starting off with this plane here on the bottom of the neck. Now I know that that's much too uh, yellow. Let's take some of the gray here, but that's okay. Um, I'm just trying to cover these large shapes and create kind of a ground that I can work on. 
adding a little more pink. So I am going to vary the hue a little bit. But not that much. I'm going to try and keep the hue changes rather small. What I'm trying to do is just lay down a ground of color that I can work on top of. So I'm not trying to finish one section at a time. Uh, now that's a that's a pretty valid way of working. Um, I, I like sometimes just spending all my time in one spot. Uh, but with this one, I'm really going to try to kind of keep the entire picture in mind, even though we did spend quite a bit of time with these planes. So here's a little bit of light here for the clavicle. And remember this little area right here um, is the super sternal notch. I'm going to add a little bit of alizarin permanent, just a tiny bit into here. Just a little bit there. A little more light. So let's go ahead and remix that color. Kind of helps when you remember what your color mixtures were. In my case, my color mixtures are super simple. So just uh, yellow ochre, cadmium red medium, titanium white. I tell you what, this region is much cooler um, in temperature, so I'm gonna cool it down with burnt umber. Burnt umber is actually a very nice coolant. Notice how that flesh tone became much cooler. So let's go ahead and apply this color. Yes, I know that that shape was off, this one right here in the um, underpainting, and that's all right. Consider it a building process. Always consider it a building process. Try not to stress yourself out by telling yourself it has to be perfectly right each time that each brush stroke has to count all the time. And um, it's not always the case. Sometimes you just wanna relax and take your time. So that's what we're doing with this one. So I just switched brushes here, making a combination of burnt umber, titanium white. Actually, I should have used flake white. So flake white, burnt umber. Now this area here is going to be a little bit lighter than I had it. Now switching back to the lighter brush. Let's go ahead and just push this shape up a little bit. Now it's a little bit of alizarin permanent, some titanium white, a little bit of yellow ochre, burnt umber. We're going to scumble this very bright red into this area and I'll Tell you why in a second. A little bit of burnt umber. And the reason I'm scumbling quite a bit of pink is uh, I'll show you. Now with the titanium white directly onto this, I can actually much more quickly mix on the painting itself. So now I just threw in some sap green over top of it. So sap green and alizarin work very nicely together. Now we're getting a nice even distribution of color, which is what we want. Alizarin, let's use some ultramarine blue, burnt umber just to make sure. We don't get a violet. So burnt umber will help me neutralize the ultramarine blue. Paint that color in there. Sap green. Let's create this plain change. Okay, so now I'm gonna take from this lighter region Paint in this plane here. 
a little bit more titanium white. And that ought to do it. Now we're going to mix directly onto the painting again. So we're going to take just a lizard and very quickly we're going to get the shape here for the dress. All right, so now we have a little bit of color here for the dress. Now the next thing I'll do is find a color for, actually, let's, let's work on the hair first. So the hair is a nice area to relate to the dress. So I'm gonna keep my color mixtures rather simple. Now the hair is really similar to the dress. Um, so, the difference between the two colors, at least to me, um, is that the hair is a darker red in value, but it's also less chromatic than the red for the dress. So that's why I went straight a lizard with the dress. And with the hair, I'm using burnt umber and a lizard. The burnt umber will help to make the value darker and it will also help to cut down on the saturation of the red. And right now I'm just trying to get very simple flat masses of color. Flat meaning not really too many value changes. Go ahead and push that down. So again, not too many value changes, but rather just simple flat shapes of color that I can build on top of. Now I'm going to paint the value that I want for the background. So let's just mix right on top of the canvas. So burnt umber and ultramarine, sorry, burnt umber and sap green. Now I'm gonna to have to make a very uh, uh, intricate value comparison. I wanna say that the background and the hair, the majority of the hair are very similar in terms of their value. What will set them apart will be the hue. So the background is gonna be of course much more greenish and the hair is going to be of course more red but they're very similar in terms of their value so let's go ahead and just fill in the rest of this all right so we've just about filled the rest of the background with that very simple color combination of sap green and burnt umber uh, so now the next thing we're going to have to do is um, kind of really get down to business on the exact shapes now for the portrait. All right, so now it's gonna be really tiny shape time. So we're gonna go in with a little bit of burnt umber, yellow ochre, and a um, tiny bit of yellow ochre. Sorry, <laughs> burnt umber, yellow ochre, a tiny bit of flake white. And uh, we're gonna establish that uh, dark shape there. And now with a little more of the flesh tone from the palette, I'm going to create a very subtle gradation of value. See that? Very subtle little gradation of value. Now switching brushes, I'm going to go back to the lighter 
uh, flesh tones on the palette. See that? So now with these lighter uh, flesh tones, I'm going to create a very uh, definitive edge here. Now this is going to be how we, um, <clears throat> sorry, this is going to be how we further describe uh, the specific shapes of the portrait. Now I um, I kind of always recommend working general to specific, but it's also a good idea to know how to get specific. And so this is how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to analyze each little section now in this same fashion. So I'm going to actually raise this shape up a little bit. And I'm using a combination of ultramarine blue and burnt umber. It's kind of raising that shape up a little bit. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of sap green into the middle tone region of the palette. Now we have this shape here. Little shape here for the iris. And now with the other brush, I'm going to use a little bit of ultramarine blue and ivory black and some burnt umber. And we're going to establish this shape right here. So this is going to be the back of the tear duct, adding a little bit more light. Uh, we're going to use just a little bit of alizarin with the flake white. Now in this, now with these instances, the flake white is going to be really important um, because now I can use less titanium and bring these values up in the same fashion, uh, but it's just a little easier for me to use the flake white now to very slightly raise the value. And now we're going to have a darker shape right here. Some little indications for the eyelashes there. Can't forget the eyelashes, right? Okay, so I'm going to use a little bit of ivory black and burnt umber. Ivory black, burnt umber. Now we have the pupil. A little dark shape there for the pupil. Now with the other brush, I'm going to clean it off with a little bit of mineral spirits. And I'm going to use the titanium white and the burnt umber. A little bit of titanium white and burnt umber. Very carefully now. Have the little highlight. Now switching to the other brush, um, burnt umber, yellow ochre, a little bit of flake white for this region here. Now notice we're starting to add hue variation to the mix now. To vary the edges a little bit here. So I want this transition of edge, sorry. I want this transition of edge to be a little bit softer. I just had to get a darker value. I want this edge to be a little bit softer. All right, so let's move on to the mouth. Remember I said the mouth might have been too big. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, make these shapes a little bit more specific and at the same time uh, apply some drawing correction. 
So I'm going to go ahead with another flat shape. Just cover right over here so this color is no more complicated. Then a little bit of alizarin permanent, flake white, a little bit of burnt umber, and some yellow ochre. Not very complicated. Now I'm going to use a little bit more burnt umber and a tad bit of sap green. Let's add a little bit more burnt umber. I'm going to add now a plane change. This is the first real plane change I'm adding onto the lip. So this plane change just means that the uh, area over here is just getting a little darker. Okay, so I did say that I would make the shape for the lips a little bit um, smaller. So now what I really need to uh, adjust is this bottom lip. I'm going to push it up a little bit like this. And I'm going to uh, pay attention to the corners now. So I'm actually going to, with a little brush stroke, just push this up, move this here. I know it might look kind of goofy, but I'm using the shapes of color to help me adjust the drawing a little bit. So I'm moving this up. Very simple. All right, so now I'm going to add a little more space up here. And again, this is just to kind of shrink the shape for the mouth. I'm not trying to copy uh, the image that I'm looking at, but I am trying to add a tiny bit more specificity. And while we're moving that up, uh, let's go ahead and just add this little bottom shape perhaps a little more than we need. So let's modulate that value a little bit. A little bit more sap green for that mixture. Gotta have patience with portrait. There are many stages in the portrait where things just work and they work very quickly and very easily. And there are other times where you really got to work for things. And um, this is one of those instances because trying to pay attention to the shape of the orbicularis oris, that is this W looking shape, the bottom of the orbicularis oris muscle. And I'm trying to move, or sorry, I'm trying to carve the shape for the mouth into a much more specific shape. So I'm kind of doing two things at once. Now this is because in the underpainting, I, I kind of messed up the drawing for that, which is okay. I mean, it's considered a building process. Mistakes are okay. It's a natural thing. It's just um, learning from the mistake that you made in the underpainting and knowing how to tackle it in the color portion of your painting. That's all. And while we're at it, let's add a little more light to the side of the orbicularis oris there. Remember, the orbicularis oris is all of this. All of this. Now, notice I'm not really that worried about the tiny details for the mouth. I'm not going into the mouth and trying to perfectly delineate all the tiny little details involved in the mouth. Rather, I'm thinking of this large general shape and how the shapes fit with one another. The details are not as difficult as the large overall structure. So now I think that that's a little closer. So what I'm going to do is go in with a little bit of ivory black and titanium white and put in this little bit of light that I see for the teeth. Seeing just a tiny little bit of light there. Then I'm going to, uh, with a different brush, add a little bit of burnt umber, ultramarine blue, 
and a little bit of yellow ochre just to bring up the value a little bit and I'm going to put in this little dark shape here for the mouth. Now I have to consider aesthetically, in terms of aesthetics, aesthetics, uh, if I want to keep the little light for the teeth. So let's drop a vertical line here. So this dark shape goes here. At this point now, I really am questioning whether I want to keep the um, the light for the teeth. So I'll just think about it as I'm filling in a little more alizarin permanent here. I tell you what, I'll keep it, but I'll show a very tiny bit of it. And at the same time, uh, one way that you can get something out of focus in a painting is to soften it. So I'm going to use my fan brush and just soften it so that it's even less um, noticeable. Now I'm going to go back in and reestablish these shapes. So burnt umber, a lizard and permanent. I'm trying to figure out enough information to get the form to read. And the information is the um, the hue and the value. So the hue being what color I want, the value being how light or how dark do I want these shapes to be. Let's leave a little accent mark here with just a little burnt umber. Let's let that be a single brush stroke. So single brush stroke time. Now I'm going to add some titanium white yellow ochre, and a tiny bit of alizarin permanent. Hopefully, single brush stroke time again. Trying to get that light back. So that might be single brush stroke time, or I might add another little light, and let's, let's add another little sparkle. Just for fun. Another little sparkle there. But of course, let's soften the edge for the sparkle. I don't want it to stick out too much. So I'm using the edge, I'm using the corner of my fan brush to do that. And there we have a mouth. So now we're gonna move on to the side plane of the face. So with a little bit of burnt umber and a lizard and permanent, and a tiny bit of sap green just to cut back on the strength of the alizarin permanent. I'm going to go in kind of with color and to draw the outer boundary. So this is the ramus of the jaw. It has to move out like that. And it goes inwards like that. Actually, it's, the mandible is kind of more at an angle like this. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, just note that I needed a little more color there, or a little more light. So now let's go into some of the planes for the side of the face, the side planes of the face. So with burnt umber, a little bit of a lizard permanent, and some yellow ochre, let's go ahead and establish this dark. And it's all right if we get the color and the value wrong in the beginning. Um, what we're trying to do is establish the location of that shape. Now this shape here is for the uh, zygomatic region of the face. So that is the cheekbone. So that comes out like that and then down like this. I know it's kind of hard to see. All right, so now that we have the shape for the cheekbone, let's go ahead and look at the plane uh, to the left of it. So this plane here should be getting a little darker. Uh, so let's go ahead and add some burnt umber. Now the hue, it 
doesn't really change, I don't think. The here doesn't really change that much. So just burnt umber in the color we already had. All right, so now I'm going to look at the side plane of the zygomatic region. So this is kind of like the bottom plane and then the side plane now here will be kind of the middle plane. See how we're thinking kind of structurally here. So that was too light. So let's go ahead, just make it a little darker. And it's kind of a push and pull with these shapes, to be honest. But you can clearly see the um, kind of the like a sculptor just chopping slabs of clay until the sculptor gets the right cut. All right, so over here, see how we're modulating the tone? So we kind of have a little step here. So one, two, three, four. And that's how we're building this structure. And over here, this plane is a little bit more broad because this is kind of the maxilla region of the face. Maxilla meaning the little bone of the skull over here. It's a little more broad in this fashion, meaning it's just wider throughout here. All right, so now let's consider the edge quality. So I'm going to just uh, clean off that brush with a dry piece of paper towel. And then I'm going to just kind of soften this edge. So I'm softening the boundary between the plane changes. So let's soften it even more. Now you can consider this blending. Um, and I think that blending is all right, as long as you delineate the plane changes uh, that you're trying to do. And then with blending, just a little light touch here, you soften the edge. So imagine the sculptor would have been chopping away at these planes. And then once the sculptor was uh, satisfied with the direction of the planes, they just go in and soften. Perhaps if it's marble, they use, I don't know what they would use, to be honest, sandpaper or something. All right, so let's even modulate this value transition here. Meaning, let's try to connect these two by softening the edge in between them. Very simple there. Now then, as the zygomatic bone starts to go away from the light here, the mandible will actually come out and pick out a little more light. And it's also going to be a little cooler, so I'm going to use a little more ivory black into the mixture. Ivory black and flake white. Very similar to the underpainting color, so I'm not going to use too much paint for this. See how it gets lighter here, just beneath the uh, zygomatic bone. And then it's going to get darker again over here as we approach the side of the jawbone. So I'm just going to use more burnt umber. And now we're really starting to describe the side plane of the face a little better. Of course, this has to be darker right about here. So burnt umber, ultramarine blue, just to get that value very quickly. A little bit darker there. Let's use a little more alizarin and burnt umber. Create an even more smooth transition. I think we'll go ahead and add a little bit more color into the background, or that is, I think I'm going to make the value a little bit darker. So 
I still want it to be greenish. So let's go with a sap green, ivory black, ultramarine blue. Let's see what this tone looks like. I think that ought to work. So let's just go ahead and cover the rest of this now. All right, so now that we've covered the background with a little more color, I think let's uh, let's go ahead and do a little more for the hair. So I'm gonna take the same brush that I had for these uh, red shapes. Down here, I'm gonna use a little bit of alizarin, some cadmium red. Let's go ahead and just uh, get some little shapes now. Little shapes of light. Add some yellow ochre to that mix. Very simple. Let's go ahead and move all the way down here. Let's describe some of the little curls that the hair is making. So I'm just using cadmium red medium and yellow ochre. Let's just have some fun with it. Swirl here. Whirl there. Let's not lose uh, sight of the plane. So, so each lighter region of value is also indicating a plane change. So even the hair can have individual little plane changes. Little light shape here. And you can kind of pick and choose which areas you want to emphasize. Let's add even some little shapes of light in here too. A few little shapes of light. These soft edges will help to contrast the sharper edges in here. All right, so now with the dress, I'm gonna use a little bit of ultramarine blue and a alizarin crimson and a tiny bit of ivory black to uh, articulate the dark shapes now for the dress. So uh, rather than copy the exact pattern for the dark shapes of the dress, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of loosely abbreviate them. So this goes here. Little shape down here. So I'm gonna use the first red pass that we put in. Remember this is just a lizard that we um, scumbled on. Um, I'm going to use it as the kind of middle ground for the rest of these tones, for the darker tones. I'm going to use the fan brush to eliminate some of the glare. Remember, glare just means the painting is reflecting light, which is uh, not what I want at this moment. All right, so we're gonna put some little uh, bits of dark into here. All right, so to, to get the lights, the little light regions there, I'm gonna use cadmium red and a little bit of flake white. So just cadmium red and flake white. And I'm not going to be too precise with these little folds for the dress. I'm just going to try and describe it enough to just get it to read at a distance. So we actually just put a little bit of cadmium red and alizarin into this shape here. Spin the brush around a little bit. So back to the cadmium red and flake white. Let's say a light shape exists somewhere about here. And I'm going to add a little bit of a lizard and permanent. Now we have some little folds. 
going to use the fan brush to eliminate some glare. Let's do the same kind of thing over here. Just some little shapes of light. And then we'll go to the alizarin permanent. Just go ahead and scumble the rest of this down here. So just going to use alizarin permanent and ultramarine blue. Now to just scumble the rest of this. Now back to the ultramarine blue. I'm going to go ahead and put a few more little folds in here. Let's suppose this comes down to here. And let's put a dark shape there. I'm gonna add a little bit of Neo McGilt just to get the paint to flow a little better. See how it thins it out. Nice sharp edge over here. And I bet you're wondering about the tattoos. So the tattoos I'm gonna put in at the end, I just want to make sure that I get all of these little folds of the fabric to work together. And that ought to do it. Now before we put in the shadows, I need to put in, or sorry, before we put in the um, Tattoo is I'm going to put in the shadow, uh, the shadow being casted from the clothing. So I'm using just burnt umber, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of the flesh tone directly from my palette. Now it's a little cooler, so that's why I'm using the ultramarine blue. Now this shadow is coming out about here. I'm going to leave a little space in between these shapes in between the shadow and the dress just for now. So this goes, it lo almost looks like a little mountain. Goes down here. All right, so now I'm gonna try to get pretty close to the, the red. but still not quite touching the red. All right, so fan brush. And just eliminate some glare. I'm gonna clean the fan brush off first. Let's go in this direction. Try to eliminate some of the glare. That ought to do it. Now switching back to the brush with the red. Now I'm just going to move this shape up here. Not really in any kind of super specific way. It's kind of pushing this shape up. So it looks like the shadow is being casted from the shirt or from the dress. So let's just soften that edge again, the fan brush. All right, so now I'm gonna use just a little bit of burnt umber and ultramarine blue, just burnt umber, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of Neo McGilp. So Neo McGilp, again, is just my medium. Just to thin out the paint a little bit. So now we're going to put in the little designs for the tattoos. So this one comes all the way around here. So the reason I'm using a little bit of uh, my medium is just because I, I know that thinning out the paint will help it 
stick to this layer of wet paint underneath. Just following the little design. All right, so let's go ahead and fill in the rest of the designs for the tattoos. All right, and that's <laughs> that's kind of the best I can do, uh, just freehanding the tattoo. Now let's add a little detail, a little dark shape here. A tiny little dark shape for an earring. I hope it's in the right place. So there's just a little tiny speck of an earring. And of course, how would you have an earring without an ear? So let's, well, actually, I'm sure you can somehow, but I'm going to go ahead and just put a little, little touch there for kind of like a glimpse of where an ear would be. Then I'm gonna go back over that with some alizarin permanent. And I'm going to put the tiny little highlight for the earring. Earrings can be done in just a few little brush strokes. Wouldn't wanna to spend too long on an earring. Just soften that. Now before I forget, the dress has some tiny little specks of light. So what I'm gonna do is ultramarine blue, titanium white, and a little bit of my Neo McGilpa medium. So just little touches here and there. Don't wanna do too much for this. Is here and there. Sprinkle on some tiny little details. The details like this, man, they're really the easy part. Just a little touch. Let's put one even down here. And some little specks of light here. Add a little more titanium white to that. Little tiny, little tiny spots. And one all the way over here. All right, so just about one of the last things I'll do is just soften some of the edges on the uh, outside shape. So for instance, this edge. Just taking the brush and kind of feathering the uh, these two shapes together. Just softening that edge. So I want this edge to remain pretty sharp. And um, I just want it to soften a little bit around here. Just lightly touching. Now, I went overboard with that part and that's okay. Just going to get some of the flesh tone. Just kind of uh, paint that edge back in there. This is kind of like the little lost and found. So this edge, I want it to be really, really subtle. I want it to be sharp, but not as sharp as this edge. Now the reason I want this edge to be sharp is because it has a nice kind of painterly aspect, kind of like a little chop in this direction. Then it's a little softer here, then it gets sharper and sharper up here. But I'm gonna leave this be. I like the way that this edge looks. And I think, um, tell you what, I should probably put this uh, 
subtle beauty mark back. I lost it at some point. That's all right. Just a few little touches here. Don't want much. That ought to be enough. I don't want it to be too sharp. In the underpainting, I had it with a highlight, but I think I just want it like this. And with that, we have the conclusion of this week's portrait painting demonstration. I'd like to thank you all so much for watching. I really do hope that these videos are helping you out. I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.